Um, so we're going to do to end up here will hopefully be a fun exercise uh, of having a panel of folks that have um, not all but many of the, of the most, um, the most uh, uh, impactful climate organizations on Yale. So one of the things when talking with graduate students that, and, and undergraduate students that came up was what role do, that commonly came up is what role do different climate organizations at Yale play? What are their goals? How do they interact? Uh, and we thought that would be a fun way in a, a non-traditional um, and a new addition to Yale Day of Climate to end up um, the, the day. So what we're going to do is everybody's going to briefly introdu introduce themselves. Um, and after that, we have a couple questions that are prepared from a, a group of graduate students that are studying climate at, at Yale. Um, and then we're going to open it up to you all for, for questions. Um, and this is the only thing keeping you from uh, a series of wonderful posters and uh, libations. So we'll try to keep it uh, relatively brief. Um, but we, we do want to make sure there's time for, for um, conversation as well. So we can start up actually um, just introducing yourselves briefly. Oh, all right. Ah, this works. Okay. Um, my name is Anna Schurkmann. I am the managing director of the Yale Center for Network Carbon Capture. Um, I just joined the center this past uh, February. Um, yeah, what, the, what else should I say? Yeah. Do you want um, more? If that's, a lot. you know, a brief introduction to YCNCC and, yeah. and so, a brief introduction to yourself. Okay. <laughs> that, was, that was both, but very brief. Very brief. <laughs> you want more. Um, so, the more. center. <laughs> um, yeah, so as you know, the center, Yale Center for Natural Carbon Capture um, was launched about a year ago, so we have our one-year anniversary right now. The center is in the process of setting up. Um, it's sort of based around three themes that uh, Noah is much more, much more um, fluent in, at least one of them, than I am. But um, it's, it's around ecological carbon capture, geological and ocean capture, and then we're building up the, the third focus area, which is um, carbon utilization. And the whole idea is that um, some of you, especially the ones who study climate, I think are aware of the IPCC report that just came out a couple of weeks ago um, that is, um, sends a very urgent message, but within that message it also clearly says that without CDR carbon dioxide removal, we cannot reach any of the targets that, that would keep us within a, a, a temperature rise or, or climate um, change scenario that would sort of avoid the most catastrophic consequences of climate change. So this is where we're at. Um, and the center itself, uh, we're, you know, on the one hand, building up uh, very slowly and in, in this process of trying to do things properly. At the same time, we're fast-tracking a couple of things. Um, research projects that were funded, um, were funding started, I think, last year, but that was before my time, so I'm looking at you. I think that's true. Um, and um, um, some other things that are, that are happening sort of um, already, um, while we're also building the foundation for like a robust center that really can bring in um, some new ideas, new perspectives, um, cut, cutting edge research, and then also bringing this research into solutions. So the big theme of the center is science to solutions. So we don't want to get stuck in the sort of um, basic science, but it really is a question of how do we implement these things. It's because it's a matter of urgency um, in that sense. So. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, hi, I'm Gary Bredvig. Um, so I'm a professor in the chemistry department and also the molecular biophysics and biochemistry department. Um, my research is in the area of uh, artificial and natural photosynthesis. So we work on both how plants use sunlight to split water and store energy in the form of uh, chemical bonds, and also try to replicate that in artificial photosynthesis. Um, and uh, we have been working on this for a long time, and about uh, ten years ago, um, the, the Yale created the Energy Science Institute, um, and I've been the director of the institute since it was uh, founded. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, so some of you may not know a lot about the West Campus, so Yale purchased the site from Bayer Pharmaceuticals about 15 years ago and decided that one uh, uh, um, use of this, the site would be to create interdisciplinary research institutes that would be focused on some of the grand challenges we face. An interesting story to tell you. So shortly after the West Campus was purchased, there was a workshop where about 50 uh, faculty were invited to participate and brainstorm if Yale could tackle the challenges of the 21st century, what should we be working on? And, uh, and we had small breakout groups, like four or so, four or five faculty, and we went back and you know, each group 
brainstormed for a while and came back with their list of their top challenges. Every single breakout group, without an exception, had energy as the number one challenge facing humanity. And, and uh, so was, at that time, I was hammering our administration, you know, how come we don't have an energy institute? Well, there were five institutes that were created at the start, and they were all biomedical, you know, cancer biology and nanobiology and so on, um, n not energy. And uh, that changed 10 years ago when Tom Steyer and Catherine Taylor gave us a $25 million gift to create an energy sciences institute. So that got it off the ground. Um, our focus has been the physical sciences. So the other institutes on West Campus are all biologically oriented. So we're focused on the, the physical sciences. Uh, that's where my research group on artificial photosynthesis is located. And, um, and we've been growing. We've been, uh, it, the institutes have been given about 10 faculty lines to hire incremental uh, faculty. Um, and we've focused in, in the areas of material science, uh, chemical catalysis, and uh, small molecule conversions, important for energy transformations. And uh, right now we have uh, 15 PIs uh, in the institute, so we have grown with maybe one or two a year since we started. Um, we're actually the biggest institute by a good measure now on the West Campus, maybe reflecting the fact that energy is an important topic. And um, if you haven't been out to the West Campus, I'd invite you to, to come out there and you know, check out our facilities there. Hi, everyone. I'm Anastasia O'Rourke. I'm Managing Director of the Yale Carbon Containment Lab. Um, I brief introduction to myself, so I have a PhD here from Yale here, um, where I was in the School of the Environment and the School of Management, and focused on clean tech and venture capital and how to invest, you know, in startup companies in this space. So I've been in in that field for quite a long time. Um, came did a startup company myself, actually, out of the PhD program. Raised venture capital was a budding entrepreneur, um, switched over into consulting, um, working with many large companies and actually the US federal government on some of their climate strategies as well as looking at, you know, how do they reduce their own impacts um, as, say, a federal operation, so with General Services Administration and others. Um, but I came back to Yale two years ago uh, to help found our carbon containment lab, which is housed at the School of the Environment. Um, and part of the reason I did that was I really wanted to get closer again to this sort of early stage um, company creation or, or non-profit creation where you're really looking at applied solutions and bringing all sorts of different resources to bear um, on the problem. I got fascinated with this idea of negative emissions, which is carbon dioxide removal, same sort of field, and what you can actually do to, you know, I like these frontier topics, put it that way. <laughs> so at, at our lab, we're... Um, as I said, we're part of the School of the Environment. Um, we're about 10 people uh, full time, and but we also have about, I don't know, 12 to 15 interns, uh, student research interns at any one time. Uh, we have a great summer research internship program. Um, and we've got a couple of postdocs we're working with, and then we're working across the university and actually outside the university too with people like uh, Professor Planowski and others who, you know, have ideas or have particular um, science or technologies that they've been thinking of. And our role comes into play of really helping look at the market side of that, like and the implementation of it and all of the different, you know, real world problems you run into like permitting and like, you know, getting uh, investors to trust you enough to do something uh, at this really early stage. So it's a really interdisciplinary uh, lab and area. Um, we also do generate some ideas ourselves. Um, we're not only on the implementation side. Um, but we, uh, what else to say? It's a, it's a really fun group. We're discovering that there's a lot of opportunity out there um, and there's big wide open spaces for both research uh, as well as sort of testing of ideas. And a lot of investors are very excited about it. So happy to explore any and all of those themes um, as we go into this panel. Casey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anastasia. Hi, everyone. I'm Casey Pickett. Uh, I'm the Planetary Solutions Project Director and Director of the Yale Carbon Charge. Um, I came to Yale for the joint degree program between the School of the Environment and the School of Management, uh, and then went and worked for the state of Connecticut for five years, building an innovation support system uh, for early stage entrepreneurs in particular. It's called CT Next. 
Uh, I came back to Yale in 2016 to implement the Yale Carbon Charge, which is Yale's internal carbon pricing system. It operates like a carbon tax. Uh, the provost office charges different uh, organizational units for their carbon emissions. And then two years ago, um, I joined the, the nascent developing Planetary Solutions Project. Uh, the central idea behind the Planetary Solutions Project is that given that the challenges, the environmental challenges we are facing and trying to address are so incredibly complicated, uh, it is difficult to develop meaningful, you know, full-scale solutions from within any single discipline. Different disciplines have crucial pieces of uh, most full-scale solutions. So the question is, can we do more together than we can in individual disciplines or, or individually? Uh, and is there, um, well, yeah, so that, that's, that's the basic question, right? The, Another question that uh, drives me and drives the effort is um, what would it mean to bring the full weight, full intellectual weight of the university to bear on the problems of climate change, biodiversity loss, environmental health, and environmental justice? And I consider that an open and generative question. We are um, at the sort of hypothesis stage trying to figure out what can we do? Uh, organizationally, operationally, to enable Yale faculty and staff to take their work even further and have even more impact than they might otherwise have, um, given the current uh, setup of you know, of this institution. Great to be with you all. Thanks, Carla. Thanks very much. My name is Carla Staver. I'm an associate professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here at Yale. I'm also the Associate Director of the Yale Institute for Biospheric Studies, which is why I'm sitting in front of you today. Um, the Director of the Institute is back here, Eric. Um, uh, uh, so let me tell you a little bit about YIBS and what YIBS does and what how YIBS con contributes to work on climate here at Yale. Um, YIBS was founded in 1991 with a large endowment um, to essentially act as an umbrella environmental science organization on campus. Um, so integrating between what is now the Yale School of the Environment and several FAS departments that also have an educational mission and then also with some involvement from the School of Engineering. Um, so we have faculty we have faculty affiliates who are YSC affiliated, School of Engineering affiliated, also Ecology, Evolutionary Biology, Earth and planetary, what is now Earth and Planetary Sciences, um, and especially biological anthropology, um, and we essentially sort of sort of serve a dual function. Um, it's it's we we have some educational functions. So we provide some graduate students funding support. We have a large, but I, I think what is most visible about YIBS is that we provide a lot of postdoctoral fellowship funding. Um, and so we have the Donnelly Postdoctoral Fellowship Program that dates back to, I think, the founding of the Institute in the early 90s, certainly. Um, that's funded about four postdoctoral lines per year since it was founded. Um, and then since about, I think we have our graduating, there's several, I see Hutch, several Hutchinson postdocs in the, in the audience today. Um, so there's an additional 10 postdocs on campus that are working on targeted themes within, uh, within the Hutchinson postdoctoral program. Um, we also provide some sort of spark innovation funding for uh, small research projects, seed funding to, to develop research projects, um, and then we also provide some graduate student funding for various, various stages of graduate student research. Um, and so it really is sort of training oriented, and it's really an outward focus institute on trying to like enable research by, you know, equitably enable research by the Yale community at large. Um, some of that certainly is very applied and oriented towards the climate problem, so integrates well with planetary solutions. Um, but there's also, like you're going to hear, hear from a lot of people who are really f targeted and focused on carbon, but I think Yibs, Yibs really steps in when it comes to biodiversity, when it comes to ecosystems. Um, and if, if the carbon applications and the carbon solutions are the tip of the iceberg, what really supports the, ice, the iceberg more generally is like a body of both pure and applied research um, that has applications has a relationship to the ongoing climate problem, but that where that where where those applications might not be immediately obvious, and so we sort of are are interested in the in serving the community more broadly. I think that's a pretty good overview of the generality of the function that Yib serves serves on campus. So over to you. Hey there, my name is Eric Fine, and I work for the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. 
Um, ten years ago, uh, I was not working on climate change. I was actually taking people on expeditions into the mountains uh, and often on glaciated peaks. Uh, and going back to the same glaciers every year, I started saying, huh, I think I need to work on climate change. Um, and, and I started looking into climate change solutions, a lot of things related to what y'all are doing right now, and I couldn't choose. I said, we need them all. Uh, and so then I started thinking, huh, how can we get society to back all of the needed solutions um, to the extent that we need to to address this issue? Uh, and luckily, I bumped into some people doing that. Um, so the program on climate change communication we study how people think about climate change. What do they understand? What do they misunderstand? Uh, what policies do they support and for what reasons? Uh, and, and then how, do you, how does that vary across society? And then for any given piece on, uh, and, and engaging them in any solution, uh, what's the best communicational strategy to do that? A lot of us really misunderstand where the public is or where a certain audience is. Uh, and, and so we've been told by members of Congress, for example, um, that, that they were thinking of running a campaign, their own campaign, uh, based on climate change, uh, but that all their advisors were saying no. They looked at the research on what people in their area actually think about climate change um, a lot from the Yale Climate Opinion Maps, for example. And they said, huh, I think I should do this. And now they're in Congress. Uh, and we found out recently the other day uh, there, that within Google, there's the Google Maps division. Uh, and there was a team within the Maps division. They said, they, we have this idea. Uh, we want to put a little, when you say I want to get from A to B, um, we want to put a little green leaf on the option that, that is most fuel efficient. And people push back. They said, no way. People don't want climate action. People don't want us to do that. They're going to bring in all kinds of negative feedback. And luckily, there was a group within there that had seen our research. And they said, well, actually, we don't think we're going to get that much negative feedback. We think people are really behind this and that there's more concern um, and uh, appetite for action uh, than, than what we maybe suppose. So they showed them the data, and they said, okay, let's try it. And so they started that. So we work with all different kinds of organizations, uh, businesses, uh, people running for uh, office, um, people who are elected officials, um, small to, to large governments, uh, nonprofits, NGOs, to help them better, better understand their, their audiences uh, and figure out how to best engage those audiences. And then on a larger scale, uh, we do research on the US public in two times per year nationally representative surveys. Uh, and we've also been working on uh, similar national surveys in, in other countries, the ones that emit uh, the most uh, emissions uh, to try and help them better understand their audiences and communicate more effectively and get everyone taking the climate action that we need to take. Fantastic. Um, great. So what we have now is we have a couple of the, of the prepared questions from the, the graduate student panel. Um, so we'll direct these at, at one person, but anybody should, after that, feel free to interject. And then we will be sure to save some time for all of the burning questions that you have. Um, so Casey, I'll direct this one first at, at you. Um, what do you see as the importance of focusing on change in education at Yale versus um, U.S. and the global community? Um, or in other words, is transforming campus and the New Haven area essential for Yale being a leader on climate-related issues? Mm. Thanks for the question. It was actually, I should say, they phrased it. That was the very politically correct way of phrasing it. <laughs> <laughs> I catch the undercurrents. Thank you. Um, so... You know, Yale's direct impact on climate, uh, as, as the previous speaker showed, is about 200,000 tons of scope one and two emissions per year. Working on that is you know, a, a drop within a drop within a drop of, in the bucket, right? Uh, that's not where we're going to make our, our biggest impact, but it's really important work to do because, I think for, for a few reasons, uh, one is it sets... Uh, or participates in a global norm, uh, the more that 
people look around and see that other organizations are taking this work seriously, the more seriously I think we, we all take the work. Um, Yale's most important products uh, and, and ways of making impact are probably through its research and through the work that people who come through here go off and do. And so having really practical um, you know, engagement around these topics is, uh, and it can be an important way for research to, um, to be tested and, and kind of ground truthed, and also the opportunities that students have to um, engage in change making. Um, those can, people learn really important skills uh, through that work, right? Whether it's engaging with the university or with uh, the city or members of the community. Um, I think that's about all I have to say on that one. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Well, I just think uh, students in particular, but also faculty and staff expect this of the institution and that we're all taking care of our own, you know, of our own impacts as well and making progress on it. So to not do anything would be a huge miss and a problem. And, you know, it's, and it's, you learn a lot by, by doing it yourself. <laughs> I mean, you really understand the organizational realities and, and trade-offs and costs and things in a way that, you know, yes, you can read a paper about it, but it's, if you live it, it's a very different type of learning. So I think I've participated, for example, in buying, helping Yale buy carbon offsets, um, working with Casey and a whole working group. And in, as a way of learning it, there's nothing like doing um, to really learn something. So I would encourage people to get involved in these sort of practical things on campus because you really actually see the realities of, of decision making and it's, it's quite fun. And you can see progress in your own backyard. <laughs> Great. Um, all right, so the next one, Gary will direct to you first, but maybe uh, Anna you could follow up on. Um, so this is a question on timelines of, of organizations' goals. So one of the things, obviously, rapid change is needed. Um, that's a message we, we keep being dealt. But also, transformation and, and a system that is fundamentally different from the one we have is, is also needed. So from yeah. your organization, how do you weigh the pros and cons of achieving something on the short term versus thinking about something that is a fundamentally different future? Yeah, so this is a, this is a real challenging topic and problem. Awesome. And so the, you know, the, the energy industry you know, is a multi-trillion dollar industry and the infrastructure, multi-trillion dollar infrastructure, it's not going to be changed overnight. Um, and in fact, one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about is how can we develop new technologies for sustainable renewable energy that can plug into the existing infrastructure? You know, so people talk a lot about the hydrogen economy, for example. The problem is we don't have an infrastructure for transport, you know, delivery, and you know, we don't have hydrogen stations. You know how many hydrogen fueling stations there are in Connecticut? How many do you know? Two. One. Proton on site? <laughs> you're only off by a factor of two. And, you know, with your within a factor of two, by my you know, book, you're pretty good. <laughs> so so th this is going to be a big problem if we want to convert to a, hy a hydrogen economy. We, we have an infrastructure for liquid fuels. And I think that is the kind of sustainable technology that we need to develop, is using renewable energy to create liquid fuels that can plug into our existing infrastructure. That would make it a little bit faster transition. But... Another aspect of this is something that our institute is not going to solve, and that's the economics of energy. And that's the biggest bottleneck right now. Fossil fuels are just so darn cheap. We're never going to be able to outcompete out the, the cost on the basis of cost without a carbon tax, without you know, really pricing the, you know, the impacts of burning fossil fuels. And that's a, that's a, a, a political question, and we're never going to solve that by better research. And so th I think we need to to um, think both in terms of development of new technology, new, new, new science, and it partner that with the policies that, that, that would enable it to, be, you know, to transform our energy industry. And that's something that we don't do really well right now at Yale, and we're actually talking about how can we do that better. We have good science people, and we have good you know, with world's leader in energy economics, Bill Nordhaus, won the Nobel Prize, yet we're not really working together very well. And I think Casey's, you know, Planetary Solutions Project is, it, it is an effort to try to bring these groups together. And, and that's maybe what we have here, too, is we have people from these different programs that uh, are starting to be connected a little better, but still not that, that, that doing that well. Well, Steve, 
see how well the happy hour goes out. <laughs> yeah, and yet, you know, I, uh, one thing I, I can also, maybe a little bit late, related to the first question, you know, so Yale, like it or not, is a very visible institution, and we need to lead by example. You know, so if we can do something on campus that sets an example, that's important. Even if it makes a really tiny impact in our carbon footprint, it sets an example, and I think that's something we need to be aware of and, and strive to, towards. And if you want to follow up on the YCNCC goals, uh, you know. Yeah, so I think that's exactly where we fit in because the transition to, to renewable energy and, and all of that is just um, not going to happen fast enough. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think there's there's two uh, several approaches within the center. And again, I think you've been in those discussions more. You correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and the, the the idea is right. We want to we want to develop solutions that sort of bridge that gap um, or help bridging that gap. Once we're once there are there is infrastructure and there are solutions that are that are sort of longer term solutions. Um, but then at the same time, um, there needs to be there needs to be a rapid approach to sort of drawing down the carbon from the atmosphere and, and putting it somewhere. But then we also need to think about well, where do where does it where does it stay, right? And how long does it stay where 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 we put it? And then where does it go from there if it goes somewhere? Um, so yeah, I think the the way we think about it at the center is really um, sort of uh, yeah, you know, like an, like a, um, we're we're there to to sort of complement all these other efforts um, and. Yeah, similar to what you were saying, I think one of the things I have uh, on my list to do is to connect with everyone who is on this stage, actually, um, to see how the centers can work together or how our initiatives can work together. Some of them, I've, some of you have already talked to, but um, that's that's the that's the thing. I think the the goal for the center is really to connect and really leverage what is already there on campus, and make that connection that that you were also talking about um, is so needed with all of this, right? Great. Um, okay, so Carla, uh, we'll direct this next one at you, and this is something you already addressed. Um, this is one I should say, you can tell I didn't write these questions because this question is, is not my favorite. <laughs> um, there is a strong focus on carbon dioxide removal <laughs> and cutting emissions, um, <laughs> which is warranted, of course, <laughs> given uh, my research interests. Um, how do we ensure that other aspects of climate science and other aspects of um, the negative impacts of changing climate are not neglected in Yale's priorities um, and, in, um, and in where Yale bestows resources. I think I probably want to throw this one to Casey in very short order, but I will give a very short answer and then ask Casey to step in. Um, and I, I do think, I, I, I know why you gave me this question, which is that I think that that is where YIBS has a very large role to play. Um, and so explicitly thinking about carbon drawdown and carbon capture is something that is interesting for obvious reasons to a wide variety of people when we look at climate solutions. Um, but uh, the global carbon cycle, increasing carbon dioxide, increasing methane, N2O, um, and then land use change have large implications for the functioning of ecosystems and for biodiversity, biodiversity maintenance, conservation. Um, and there's sort of like a, you know, there's a whole slew of issues, which actually we haven't heard all that much about today in the talks that we've heard today either. Um, and I think that's where sort of YIBS does something that, you know, in the Venn diagram of lots of overlap between all of our various organizations, that's probably where YIBS is kind of like out on the fringe a little bit, is really in enabling the kind of research that may be climate relevant, climate related, climate informed, um, but that also has more of an emphasis on biodiversity, ecosystems, long time scales, deep, deep, deep earth history, and so on. So uh, we do, I think we do see it as very central to our mission to think explicitly about those sorts of problems. So for instance, we have a, we have a uh, request for proposals out right now um, looking at the interface between biodiversity, uh, I can't remember exactly what it is, it's generation, maintenance, and conservation, or something like this. Um, uh, and the interface between biodiversity and ecosystems and ecosystem function, um, and how the, how the interplay between those two contributes to some of the dynamics that we might be interested in moving forward. Um, so uh, we think explicitly about that. Uh, we see it as a core part of our mission. But we hope, 
Casey, that it is also a core part of the mission of other parts of the university as well, and that we would hope to see that core mission growing because uh, certainly the climate system is something that's fundamentally important, but it's not the only thing that's fundamentally important, and that's not the only thing to which we are seeking solutions. So uh, is, that, is that a good segue, Casey? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I couldn't agree more. The, the, the areas of excellence in this university that relate to the environment are many, um, and as I introduced the Planetary Solutions Project, I, I mentioned four really broad areas, climate, biodiversity loss, environmental health, and environmental justice. These are all areas where we have incredible excellence at Yale. Um, the, the fact that the first uh, major uh, new initiative to be born sort of through the Planetary Solutions Project is the Center for Natural Carbon Capture should not be uh, interpreted as uh, anything like you know, we're done now, right? That, that's just a start. Uh, there's, there's a lot more that is in the pipeline, um, and there's a tremendous amount of, of excellence and interest um, within the faculty, the staff, the students, uh, alumni, and, and, and you know, companies that are interested in, in working with um, Yale on solutions. So um, the clock is ticking. Obviously, uh, I don't want to say be patient because uh, we all need to be working just as fast as we possibly can. Um, but there's some really good things that are um, that are coming together that I think we should look, look forward to. There, there's a faculty committee that um, the Carla sits on um, that uh, is advising the the provost office about areas where that, that might make sense um, for uh, you know where Yale's potential ex existing and potential excellence meets a uh, crucial opportunity out there in the world. If you look at the Planetary Solutions framework, which is available on planetarysolutions.yale.edu, uh, um, there's a 10-item framework that calls out 10 of these areas where, uh, you know, sort of like a, a Wayne Gretzky skating to the puck um, idea, where, where does Yale excellence uh, exist and where could it grow in ways that intersect some of the most important problems uh, in the world. And that's a, a useful, I think, framework for thinking about uh, major areas of opportunity uh, that we should be looking forward to at Yale. Fantastic. Always love to see Wayne Gretzky references. Um, so uh, Eric, well, one last question before we open it up to, to you all. Um, there's a question uh, on, on climate communication in some ways. So it's, it's easy to make a case that um, policymakers and communities are, are not embracing the message of climate change being urgent. Um, so what can we, what can any one of us do to actually better communicate or to make a difference on climate change communication? There's something we call the spiral of silence, and it stems from, from this. So we ask people, hey, give us your estimate. What percentage of people out there say that climate change is happening? We ask people in the U.S., and they, they estimate mm, about half. Um, and that's not true. Uh, right now, 76% of people in the U.S. say that climate change is happening. The majority um, are also, also say it's mostly human caused. The majority say they're worried um, about it, but we don't know those stats. Um, and and so and we suppose that there's less worry. And so I sit down at the Thanksgiving table, across from Uncle Bob. And, and I'm, I'm thinking about climate change, and I'm worried. Uncle Bob, he probably doesn't, because he comes from over there, and over there they don't think like that. And, and so I don't bring it up, because I don't think that he's going to be into that conversation, and I think he's going to be on a different page. He's thinking the exact same thing about me. Um, and, and so we know that only about a third of people talk about this with some frequency with, with their friends and family. Most people don't talk about it at all. You, you might find that surprising because you're in a little bubble probably that talks about it more. Um, and, and so this creates a spiral of silence where both my initial feeling and Bob's initial feeling is reinforced. Oh, people don't care about this. They're not talking about it. So one of the best things that you can do is break the spiral of silence um, by talking about it. And we found in our research that when you do, you're most likely going to find someone on a similar page to you across the table or wherever you're, you're meeting with folks. Um, and, and that as you start talking about it, 
you're going to learn about more impacts and more solutions uh, than, than you knew before. Um, and it's going to get both of you hyped up to want to take more action, according to our research. So if I have to just say one thing, break the silence. Talk about it. Okay, um, I don't have a watch. What time is it? What's that? 3.34. All right. Oh, that's OK. It was, yeah, it was, someone in the crowd was trying to give it to me, and I couldn't read the, I'm so blind I couldn't even catch the hand signals, which is just embarrassing. Um, all right, so plenty of time on that note about my eyesight. I think we can have plenty of time um, for some questions uh, from folks in the, in the crowd. Um, I think we can start with people in person, and then we can move to, um, to Zoom if, if folks would, would like. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, I'll just phrase this pretty broadly and, and let you guys interpret it. Um, so I, um, it, it just seems like, I mean, this is a partnership. There's lots of external partnerships with um, other universities, um, uh, companies, um, other institutions. Um, and so I'm wondering how um, you guys kind of as like the umbrella planetary solutions project, but for climate initiatives in general, just because climate is so much more collaborative um, and is so much like just really is an issue that pe many people outside of a university more so than many other research topics um, in an academic institution care about. How you guys see um, partnerships and um, donations from companies and corporations that especially ones that um, are looking to make these large contributions because of their outsized footprint on, um, on cl carbon emissions and other um, environmental impact. I know it's um, a really important part of like where funding is coming from, um, and so I'm just curious what the thinking behind that is in general. Anybody really excited to take that one? <laughs> yeah. Um, or Anna, do you wanna do you wanna take that one first? Um, sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's many parts to this, right? Some somewhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. There's, there, there are part, I think there's limits to where money can come from. Um, and I think the, the directors of our, of, of YCNCC, Liza, um, Liza Kamita and Dave Berkovici have said recently um, in an interview with the Yale Daily News that they would never accept money from a fossil fuel company, right? But we do have um, our initial gift came from FedEx and then we have had initial, um, additional funding from Southwest Airlines and Boeing. Um, and the question I think that we all have to ask ourselves is, you know, if we've ever received a package, which I have, um, I have family over in Europe, which I'm going to see via plane, which is likely 50% chance it's built by Boeing. And I've never flown Southwest, but, <laughs> you know, they are interchangeable. So the question I think we all have to ask ourselves is, um, how much can we blame an individual company um, for, for the carbon footprint that they have, right? And then the other thing is, um, what I personally find very exciting about this center is that we get to work with these companies, right? There's genuine interest in understanding what they can do. FedEx has a very uh, comprehensive uh, sustainability strategy, which goes, you know, into, um, I think, I might not get the number right now, but I think they want to be carbon neutral by 2050 and sort of uh, halfway there uh, by 2030 or something. It's a very ambitious um, um, goals that they have, but at the same time, they face a lot of challenges and they do need the information and they do need good data. They do need solutions ultimately, right? And that is what we can provide and that is what Yale can provide, right? Not, not we as the center, but everybody here at Yale. Um, and that's where these corporations come in and the collaborations between the individual initiatives within Yale because this is one way we can get in there and really get our message across and really provide um, good solutions um, where we don't rely on an article that they get somewhere or something. We can really talk and we can really understand what are the problems that they're facing um, and, and see you know how, how can this be addressed. Not that they're saying what we're what we're supposed to do, because they they don't have any influence over that. Um, but at the same time, I think it's a very good. I, I personally find it very exciting to have that that um, connection. And, and yeah, I think 
I will still, you know, go and, <laughs> and visit my family, hopefully, um, and I will receive packages. So I think that's, it's just the reality, right, that we, um, that we live in. And I, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very difficult question. But ultimately, I think um, uh, the directors have drawn a clear line of where they, where they would not be willing to go. So, which I personally find reassuring. Great, Carla, do you wanna follow up on that? Yeah, I'd love to add something, but Casey, if you want to go first. Do you want me to go first? Okay. I would, so I would add sort of two things to that statement. The first is that I think where we're really well-placed at an institution like Yale and many other institutions like Yale are well-placed well in a similar place is that we, as an R1 university, we're the place where we combine an, a strong educational mission, and that's an undergraduate educational mission with a master's in YSE and a PhD educational mission across YSE, School of the Environment and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, um, where we combine that educational mission with a research mission, right? So it's sort of like where, you know, great education and great research meet. Um, and there's something really powerful about the confluence of those two things. And I would, you know, I, I, we do this very well already, and I would love to continue to, to see us continue to invest in that sort of confluence of missions. Um, so, and, and I think, the, especially as somebody who's in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences within Yale College, I think a lot about the ways that we are educating our undergraduates and whether we're serving our undergraduates as they look forward to a future for the next several decades and whether we're preparing them well uh, in climate change, in biodiversity, in human livelihoods, and in how all of these issues integrate with each other. So I think, I, I would probably argue, I mean, I really, I'm a, I'm a scientist and I'm a researcher and I love what I do and I believe in what I do, but I think where we have the most multiplicative impact is on the way that we educate, like the many, many people that pass through our classrooms and through our labs um, and who will go out into the world and make multiplicative impact as they, as they go about whatever they decide to do with their lives. So I think I'd love to see us continue to invest in that. And I would probably argue, and this is a little bit of possibly a controversial point, is that we have a little bit of work to do, especially on the Yale College end, in trying to make sure that we are preparing our students the way they need to be prepared for the future that they face. Um, so I think that's one thing that I would say. I think the other, I mean, specifically with respect to whose money we take and how we use it, um, I would emphasize, and I think hopefully everybody on this panel, I believe that everybody on this panel believes this, is that what, as, 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 as an educator, but also as a scientist, the integrity that we bring to that problem is absolutely central, and we should never let that move anywhere. Like the front, it, that should be at the front and center of your mind all the time, right? Um, scientific integrity, academic freedom, and those are really core fundamental values as scientists, as researchers, and as members of this university. Um, and I certainly take that really seriously. I think everybody on this panel does take that seriously. But it's, that's, like, that's sort of like a real non-negotiable for somebody in our business. And I, it's probably worth saying out loud, which is why I wanted to say it out loud. Um, but with that, Casey, I think you probably have something to add, too. So. Sure. I, I, and I hesitate to dig in too hard on this question, because there are probably other questions. But it's a really, I think it's a really important question, not just for universities, but for uh, as we think about how we're going to meaningfully address climate change, biodiversity loss, and some of the other challenges, to think through what is the relationship between, um, between efforts of, I'm not quite sure how to set up the, what's on, on, on the, different, the two different sides, right? But the um, efforts that are, that are working hard to change the power structure and change the system dramatically and quickly um, on one side, maybe, and uh, people and organizations that, are, that already have a great deal of power and influence um, on another side. We can set up that dichotomy. Uh, and there's, I think it's, I think, I'm glad you asked the question. I think we should be having this conversation a lot. Uh, I don't know um, what the right answer is in, in different situations and you know, where, the, where the lines are. I think one, crystal clear line, as Carla said, um, making sure that, uh, that academic freedom uh, is maintained and that there isn't undue influence um, by people contributing money um, to climate work. If there's an aspect of greenwashing that's going along with this work, um, that's, that's a problem. Uh, it would be naive to think that there isn't any aspect of that that goes along with some of the good that this money can do. Uh, on the other hand, I think that if we were to take an approach as a society to, um, to ignore the potential good that people who have been involved in 
uh, a lot of the damage that's going on. Um, I think we would be cutting off some of the tools that we've got to address these problems. Um, and you know, I, I think about the example of, um, like in Kim Stanley Robinson's book, uh, The Ministry for the Future, if any of you have read that, the, the, we're going to confront this challenge of what do we do with, uh, with carbon sequestration and storage. The fact that one of the potential solutions there involves paying companies with the skills for digging deep you know, and putting pipes underground. Um, paying them to reverse the flow and, and put carbon underground. There's a potential solution there. And it's super controversial, um, but it's something we need to take seriously, I think, because uh, as, as you know, the, the number of solutions that are going to be required to put together to make meaningful impacts on this challenge are, are so many. It's, it's a, a real issue if we ignore any of them. Great. Um, yeah, great, uh, great question. It's obviously on the oil company specifically. It's a, it's a very um, controversial one. So great that that came up. We had some discussion on that. Two. Oh, two minutes. Okay. Well, time for um, time for one last question. Okay. Thanks, um, everybody. So actually, my question has to do with something that was slightly alluded to earlier. But I look at all the organizations sitting here. I don't really see anyone in the political dimension and interfacing with policy. So I'm curious what your takes on your respective organizations are doing to interface with policy, both at Yale and in the greater like New Haven, Connecticut, and national community. I, I can start as a quick response from that, is, as the person that picked out the panel. I, as I introduced, this is a spattering of the representative climate organizations at Yale. This is not all of the, of the climate organizations at Yale. <laughs> so, but would, um, would love to have anybody follow up on that. Anastasia, right. do you want to? I mean, we've done some interfacing with different policymakers at local, state, federal level, um, in and around particular projects that we have that we're trying to advance. And so part of it is just understanding, especially right now at the federal level, there's a lot of funding coming through the Infrastructure Act and other you know, big spending packages to understand where and how that's going to be directed. And then just from a project point of view, how we can access some of that to advance the mission that we, that we think is really important, that we've scoped out and we think has a lot of both environmental and social good and potentially economic good longer term. So it's, it's just, for us, it's about understanding what's happening rather than trying to influence it. Um, I do think that there's a role for research institutions to, to be um, providing really good science and data and analysis to different policymakers at different levels to say, to help them direct, you know, those funds or those programs in a, in a, in good, into good places. Um, because they do rely on and trust institutions like Yale to, to help be a little more neutral on that front um, and to be very analytically rigorous about it and say this makes sense and this does not make sense or here are the problems that you may you know, encounter along the way, here are some externalities you may have not have thought about. Um, because some of these are really big programs that they're advancing, especially right now. We've had less experience internationally, but I think there's lots of people at Yale working more on more the international climate negotiations and all sorts of things internationally. They're just not happening to be on this particular panel today. <laughs> Great. Um, okay. Yeah, with that, let's um, thank all of our panelists. And...